Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MEEP members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. Live from St. Paul, Minnesota, we welcome you to another season of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers who are prepared to answer your questions and discuss important issues affecting citizens of Minnesota. Now, here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators. We're delighted that you have joined us on this fine Thursday evening for another hour of discussion about public policy issues, some important and others less so. <laughs> we are uh, always pleased to have you with us and to have a distinguished panel of guests to help us unravel the mysteries of St. Paul. And we invite you this week, as we do each week, to participate in our program by sending in your questions via the electronic means given to you at the bottom of your television screen, calling in your questions, and we'll see that they get to the panel. We begin this week, as we do each week, by introducing our distinguished panel, and we have carrying the load the Senate tonight. The House is off uh, doing mysterious uh, House, conference, house uh, floor business, and so uh, they can't be with us, but we have two guests with us who are more than capable of carrying this load and have been, have been with us in the past. So we begin with those introductions, beginning with District 65 in St. Paul, Senator Sandra Pappas. Senator Pappas, you're our veteran legislator tonight. We're delighted to have you Thank with you. us. Thank tell, you. Tell, tell, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, I uh, actually was born in the Iron Range, grew up in Robbinsdale, but I've been in St. Paul since 1976. I raised my kids here, went to Central High School, uh, we live in downtown now. We've been in downtown for a couple years, and I just love it. We can, I can walk to the Capitol. And my focus the last 10 years has been on higher education and getting more kids into college and through college. Tell our viewers a little bit about, we have a couple of moments here. Tell our viewers a little bit about your life outside the legislature, career, uh, work, volunteer kinds of things. What kinds of things have you been involved Well, I actually with? have four jobs. I'm a college, <laughs> oh, well, you know, the pay's kind of low there at the legislature. <laughs> Do what you can. I'm, uh, I'm a college faculty member at Metropolitan State, so I teach classes like on how to lobby and uh, public policy analysis. I've been teaching there for since the 90s. Um, I founded an international women's leadership program at the University of St. Catharines with Dean Paula King, and we did our first international convening last summer with women from Israel and Jordan, and we're going to be adding women from Tunisia next summer. I was in Tunisia in December in Tunis, the birthplace of the Arab Spring, and I'll also be in Morocco in May, if we ever get out of here, mm -hmm. to develop partners there. And I also work for a national women's organization called the Women Legislators Lobby, and I work with my colleagues around the country to lobby Congress to reduce wasteful military spending and redirect it into human needs. So, I so just have I'm one, busy. I, I, I just have one follow-up question, and that is, uh, do you have any graduates of your lobbying program who are now knocking on your door as the state senator and saying, I'm here to lobby you on some issue? Well, I did have a couple um, that went to work for um, advocacy groups like the American Cancer Society. But mostly it's for citizen lobbyists, mm -hmm. so not too many of my students become professional lobbyists. Well, there you go. Well, we're delighted you could, that you could join us tonight. Thank you. Also joining us from District 12 uh, in Brainerd, Senator Paul Gazelka, am I pronouncing that right? Very, very good. Well, it's, uh, it, you know, enough time in practice I can get there. Yeah. Tell the viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a, a first-time senator from <laughs> District 12. Uh, that district is changing. I'll be in District 9 coming up, but uh, that's the Crow Wing County Brainerd area and, and Morrison County Little Falls area. Uh, I have a, I'm have building a bridge with Senator Pappas. I graduated from Virginia, Minnesota on the Iron Range, so mm -hmm. Um, background, uh, I'm an insurance agent uh, in my business practice up there. When I, During session, it's hard to get up there when you want to actually do some work, but that's how I try to balance uh, uh, a, as a citizen legislator. And uh, as far as volunteer time, uh, one of the things that uh, I like to do is volunteer at our, at our Brainerd Teen Challenge Center up there. It's, uh, I know there's a big one in the Twin Cities and one in Duluth, but the one I, I connect to is the one up in Brainerd. Well, very good, and we're again delighted that you're joining us. Now, I said at the beginning of this program that there were important issues and some issues that are of lesser importance. 
Uh, that's a, probably a value judgment I shouldn't make, but I'm going to make it. <laughs> and we're going to talk about uh, uh, the uh, alcohol at uh, TCF, Stadium, TCF. Uh, TCF Stadium, because there's been some activity on that. Senator Pappas, tell us uh, what you know about that issue. Well, um, kind of a conflict over alcohol at the Gopher Stadium. The university wanted to have it in the suites for the adult um, suite people, <laughs> and none of the Big Tens had alcohol available in the stadium, and that became a conflict with certain legislators who felt that was elitist and that there were a lot of adults who went to Gopher Games and were just regular Joes sitting in the regular seats and should be able to have a beer, and they were able to do that at the Metrodome. Mm -hmm. So kind of a um, stalemate for a couple years. The university just said, okay, we won't do any, because that was what the legislature said, is either do it for everyone or nothing, and they decided nothing. And they had to discount their suites then. They lost probably millions of dollars that went to their athletic program because they, people paid less than to go in the suites, which are lovely, by the way. I, would, I was there a couple times this fall. Um, during games where we lost, but we won't talk <laughs> there, about that. There's been a lot of that, but they're working <laughs> on that problem. So anyway, the compromise is that there'll be like a beer garden in the main seating area at one end of the stadium, and people can be ID'd and then can go in the beer garden and still watch the game from there and have a beer. And so that will mean that they can have alcohol then in the suites. And it was a reasonable solution, and... Um, I mean, maybe it took a new president or it took something <laughs> to broker that deal. Does that, uh, Senator Gazelka, is that, uh, does that one look like to be one of the non-controversial issues that we're going to deal with in this session? It's going yeah, to I sail right through, we hope. Well, it I did think, already. Yeah, I, this, this session, uh, both Senator Pappas and I serve on the Commerce Committee, which deals with all the liquor bills. And so I think most of them were on the same page. And you know, as far as the uh, the Gopher Stadium, you know, the other side of it was they were concerned that, you know, we're not setting a good example for the, the college students. But in the end, I think what we have is common sense, and I think it'll work well. All right, very good. Well, now that we've taken care of that, let's move on to the uh, to what is usually the principal topic of discussion in the even-numbered session, that is, of course, the bonding bill. And l let me start with you, Senator Gazalka. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the, um, the, the, the Senate's bonding bill, the, Senate major the majority party in the Senate mm -hmm. that has proposed the bonding bill, and we'll start from there and see where that leads us. Well, it's interesting. In the Senate, uh, you know, we, even on my side of the aisle, the Republican side, there's um, uh, more than one viewpoint. Uh, the bonding bill that, that is coming forward is uh, uh, north of $450 million. Uh, The House uh, bonding bill is uh, more than $200 million, less than 300. And so the, this first uh, stab at it, I'll say, you know, has a few projects in there that some of us uh, raise our eyebrows on. But uh, um, and that's why I say we we have different uh, positions within the, uh, our group. Uh, I recognize that last year we spent already spent 500 million in a bonding bill, and so to have another one now, uh, many of us want it to be reasonable. Um, and we'll see. The, the governor has a bonding bill proposal as well that's uh, north of $700 million. And it's, it's always an interesting process because, you know, do you just take care of your, your uh, statewide significance infrastructure issues or do you provide for some of the more local or more regional projects? And, and it's, it's part of its horse trading. And so we're just going to have to see how it plays out. And, but that's kind of the, the general overview of where we're at right now. It just, just was introduced yesterday. Senator Pappas, your thoughts on the bond? Worst bonding bill I've seen in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> there, you must not have a project in there. <laughs> there is just so many gaps yeah. in it. You know, I mean, you have a new chair, new staff working on it, and I think there wasn't enough time spent on it to ask the proper questions. Things sometimes have to be... Um, have to be done sequentially. For example, we're building light rail in St. Paul, and we have a security issue around the Capitol. And the administration and the governor and Capitol Security want to actually build a tunnel underneath University Avenue so that when people make deliveries, there's a distance. from No one can drive a truck full of explosives up to the Capitol. Sorry to say that. But that's the, kind of the day, the times we live in. And they'd have to build it. They'd have to bring a truck across the street where it could then be loaded onto 
um, cards and then moved over to the Capitol. So it's not, it's expensive to do it, $6 million. The governor's the big safety guy. So, but it has to be done this year because light rail is coming. For anybody who's been to downtown, <coughs> I live downtown, I live above light rail and the pounding goes on till midnight every night. Um, but it's gonna happen and we really need to build that tunnel. So that's one example where the staff should know that, they should know it's a sequential problem, it has to be done. The other, the other problem is federal funding. <laughs> We've always tried to maximize federal funding. <laughs> and some of these programs, especially the environmental programs, have a five to one match with federal dollars. And so, you know, if we don't provide the match, we are leaving five dollars on the table of federal money we won't collect. For every dollar not put yes, in. Yes, right? yes, right. Um, also, I'm a big higher ed person. Um, although the, alloc the allocation to Minsku is a little bit higher, about 12 million higher um, than the governor did, and that's good news because we need to be building those science facilities and those lab facilities. Big insult to the University of Minnesota, $39 million. That's the lowest they've ever, in my memory, ever gotten in a bonding bill. And, um, and they didn't have big glamorous projects. They have to redo their heating plant. This is the boiler plant. The boiler plant, by, yeah, uh, $54 million. Yeah. And so that's a big gap in the bonding bill. Um, no St. Paul, Minneapolis projects, no Duluth projects. That's um, obviously a very big gap when you're looking at your three major cities and our top requests for each city were not granted. I mean, there's always multiple requests, but not one request. You know, and keep in mind that a bonding bill is a spending bill, is acquiring more debt. And, you know, there is a balance to how much you have available, and that's why I referred back to last year, because we already spent $500 million last year. But last year was an incredibly difficult year. We, we uh, had to do, make very, very difficult decisions to remove a $5 billion shortfall and turn it to a $1.2 billion surplus. So we were able to fill back our, uh, fill up our budget reserve account, our cash flow, and begin to pay back the school shift. But so we're more cautious. We don't want to have a, at least many of us don't want to have a, a bonding bill that's too big again, knowing that we already spent 500 million last year. Well, you have to go back a little bit farther in history though, Paul, because the bonding bills have really been consistently cut back by Governor Pawlenty over mm -hmm. eight years. So there's a lot of pent up need, which is why there's a, a need to, just for our, the sake of our infrastructure to, to have a higher bonding bill. And we have, we have rules, we have guidelines that we don't want to spend more than a certain percentage of our um, of our state budget on bonding, and we're well we're well under that. We could we could do up to two billion dollars and still be under that guideline. That's and the interest it. rates are very low, two yeah. percent. So it's almost like free money right now. And it would be a good time to take advantage of low interest rates. We don't know how long we're going to have low interest rates. And it puts a lot of people to work. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of advantages. But, you know, I mean, I wouldn't want to spend all the money just to put people to work like they're doing on, on that boondoggle, the St. Croix Bridge. Mm -hmm. But I would like to spend it on higher ed facilities or facilities that are really going to educate our students so we have well-trained workforce with the best facilities so they can graduate having had the best education. Well, we need to be careful there, too, because we did have a, a different formula the, uh, up until like a year or two ago where it was 3%, I think, mm -hmm. of the... Uh, I think it was the gross revenues or whatever, but right. now we've we've changed that formula so we can suddenly borrow more. And I'm just saying that there needs to be caution as we move forward. And I think for me and for many of us, we want to stay uh, focus on um, infrastructure that has statewide significance and less on little projects that each area wants. Well, you might want to move on pretty soon. <laughs> but I, I, there's a lot to be said about this, but yeah. that thing about regional projects is once you go down that road, it's really difficult not to because yeah. you can say, okay, we're now giving, uh, we're giving Rochester $32 million. Yeah. We're giving St. Cloud $10 million. Why aren't we giving Mankato $8 million yeah. or whatever they want? I mean, and why aren't we funding the regional ballpark when we've done projects like that in other parts of the state. It's a fair question. You know, it's just, you know, it, a, a bonding bill has to be balanced, it has to be fair, it has to be both rural and metro, and this bill just is not. And compromising a bonding bill is like, uh, this side wants 300 and this side wants 400, so let's have 700. So that's Absolutely. kind of why we're that's trying the to. That's the best compromise. We're, you know, we're trying to keep it down. <laughs> well, and, the, uh, and of course, one of the things that our viewers probably should be aware of is that, um, that uh, bonding bills require, I think, 60% vote. Am I mm -hmm. right about yes. that? So, 
it's a little different animal than some other things that you see at the Capitol. We do have one follow-up question on the bonding question. It's a, it's a bit of a technical question. I'm not sure our guests can help us with it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. A viewer from Aiken wants to know, how much total bonding do we currently have outstanding, and how much do we pay on it each year? And I think the viewer's kind of going at capacity. It's, it's a capacity type question. Yeah, so. I should know that. But I do know that with even within the old formula, I don't know about this change in formula, Paul, to mm -hmm. tell you the truth. We haven't really talked about it in the bonding committee, but uh, we still do have capacity to bond. And we do, you know, we have a capital budget that's separate from our operating budget, unlike mm -hmm. the federal government. And so we really do have the capacity to do more. Well, we, I'll tell our viewer from Aiken that we'll attempt to, that's a, that's a fact question which we should be able to find the answer to. So we'll do a little nosing around. And if uh, you want to tune in next week, maybe we'll have that number for you. They might even have it on the website for the um, management and budget department. We'll check that out. All right, a viewer from Brainerd wants to talk about a DNR issue. And this is a question we had early in the program. It's come back, a body grip trap bell. Why are they not making it go into effect? Uh, this is a problem for small game hunters with dogs, and this particular viewer had his dog killed in one of these traps. Uh, let me start with you, Senator Gazzola. And end with him. <laughs> <laughs> this probably well, isn't a big issue in your district, I suspect. It's, uh, you know, some issues, it's amazing how volatile they become, and you think, you, know, they, you think they're small, but then when it's somebody whose dog is killed, it you know, becomes a much bigger deal. Uh, Senator John Carlson from Bemidji really is the point on that, and we're trying to find a way to minimize uh, animals getting caught in traps. Uh, the, the trapper groups came forward and said, we can do something different. I believe it's a conacher trap. I, and again, I'm, that's not my area of expertise, but they, they tried to make smaller the opening for it. But it is moving through, uh, and I would say there's a compromise bill. It's not exactly what either side really wants, but it's a uh, somewhere in the middle. You think there's a good chance there'll be some legislation that passes this session? I do, this? yes. Okay, all right. Um, let's talk about voter ID. We have a couple of viewers who have questions about this. A, Duluth, a viewer in Duluth wants to know where someone can go to get a uh, free voter ID, and, a, and another viewer from that famous Minnesota community, Unidentified Town, <laughs> wants to know uh, what's the impact of voter ID on absentee ballots. Uh, Senator Pappas, let's start with you and voter ID. Well, I think this whole issue is very um, problematic of, put, first of all, putting this on the ballot, um, because then it's, it creates a system that's very inflexible as technology changes and we want to change it. And also, we have one of the best voting systems, the highest percentage of voting in the country, I think. We're either first or second. And I'm really concerned what this is going to mean in terms of voting. We have very few cases of fraud. We really, you know, it, we really just need to be fixed. It's not broken. We have a great system. Um, other states have had traditionally wanted to emulate us, and being able to vote and register and vote on the same day is also a way of getting more people to vote. So I'm concerned that this is going to be a problem for seniors. My mother is not going to get a voter ID. She doesn't drive. She's 85. She can still vote. She's still capable of voting. And I don't know what it's going to mean about absentee ballots. Are they all going to become provisional then until she can trot down to somewhere and show them her identification? Um, I'm, I'm very much against it, and I think it's a very wrong thing to do. Well, I'm very much for it. Uh, this would be an area we uh, disagree on. Uh, we passed legislation last year that the governor vetoed that really addressed all those situations. Um, elderly in nursing homes, the administrator could help. Uh, if you forgot to your ID, you could pass a, or, or vote a provisional ballot. Uh, it it uh, didn't, uh, or it continued to allow townships to mail out and all those things. But uh, what this one does is a constitutional amendment that set, that people can choose. Do we want to have a photo ID for voting? It's sort of like you know, for the Second Amendment, guns, you've got to have a photo ID to buy a gun. But what it will do is eliminate vouching. You know, right now you can have you can go somewhere and bring 15 people with you and vouch for them. They can vote, and those votes will count. And and then after, if they discover that there's ballot or votes that don't line up with a voter, they count it. So this changes that where you have to you're not going to be able to vouch for somebody else. And now if you forget your ID, you you can vote, but now it's a provisional ballot. And if, if the election is close, you're going to have to come back within a period of time, probably 10 days, or you're going to have to verify that you are who you said you are. So it's, it's definitely a shift. Uh, when we look at Indiana and Georgia, those are two places that have uh, photo ID for voting. Uh, their numbers for people voting actually went up. So we, we don't feel like we're going to disenfranchise voters, but we're going to know 
that there's election integrity. And so it's, it's definitely an area that you know, people fall on different sides of it. I think both of us, both sides want to make sure that the, the voting system matters to people and, and we think this is appropriate. But we have voter integrity. We have a good system and I don't think we should be putting up barriers to, for people to vote. We have very few cases of fraud. Most of them were felons who just didn't realize that they couldn't vote because they had to be off probation or to vote. And so it's a lot of money. It's going to be a lot of money and a lot of time for local um, election officials. And there's no money in this bill for them to help cover their costs. It's going to be on the property taxpayers to cover the costs. And there really isn't an issue. In fact, we don't know how it's going to be paid for yet because this will set in place for the future legislative bodies to set how we're going to do what we're going to do. And, um, you know, we, you know, all the different groups of people we thought about, and I just don't see them being disenfranchised. You think about what you need a driver's license for now, whether it's, it's uh, buying cigarettes or alcohol or <laughs> renting a video or uh, it just, it's, it's a part of life to have your, your uh, Medicare benefits. Many things require an ID. And so in the end, uh, if people can't get it, we're going to issue a, a state issued, uh, um, not driver's license, but, but verification of who you are. Thank you. Issue, Thank you. Right. So you're listening. That's good. So, and in the end, who knows? It could be coming before somebody else to uh, make a decision. Well, there's two other groups that are going to be adversely affected, and that is um, low income people and students. Students often have a driver's license, you're right, but it doesn't have the correct address for where they're living. They're living in the dorm. They're not living in their home in Baxter mm -hmm. or in Brainerd. So that's going to be a problem for them. And also for low-income people who may lose their housing or they may move or they may move in with relatives or with friends, they are not changing their driver's license. They can't afford to do it every couple months as they move. Mm -hmm. But they will have some, they might have something else that proves a voucher or they might have a utility bill if they've just moved. And to be able to use that with a driver's license that doesn't have their correct address, but the utility bill has their correct address, currently now they can use that to vote. Under this new system, that it would give them a provisional ballot, and then they would have to return again to the polls. It's hard enough to get low-income people to go and vote once because they don't really see it, and you, they don't really see the importance to it in their to their daily lives. And they have conflicts. They're working. They have kids. They're single moms. It's a it's a it's a big issue for them to be able to vote. And so I just don't think it's fair to put more barriers in front of people. I think we should be encouraging people to vote and facilitating their ability to vote. Yeah, and I, and I don't think this legislation will prohibit that. But if this likely will go before the people, the House and the Senate have both passed similar versions. They're in the place of now hammering out the details. But I think it's going to happen, and, you know, I, I, th I think it'll be good, but we will find out. Well, we'll see what the voters do. Yes. Uh, we have a question from um, that same unidentified town we had earlier uh, who wants to know about legacy funds, and this viewer is concerned, perhaps even suspicious, that legislators think they can change how legacy funds are used and this viewer doesn't approve. Um, what's going on with legacy funds, if anything, and um, can we address this viewer's concern? Are you on the Environment yeah. Committee, Paul? Yeah, uh, well, it, the legacy funds are a constitutional amendment that sets aside funds for four different areas. One of them... Uh, uh, being, uh, well, there's four different areas, parks and trails, um, the arts, uh, clean water. I'm drawing a blank on what the fourth one is. But right now, this year, there was $99 million. Hunting that, and fishing. Thank you. $99 million for a variety of projects for, uh, related to land that would be purchased. And uh, it, it uh, cannot be taken from any other, or to, to go into any other area. We work very hard at not doing that. Um, for example, some people say, well, why don't you do that to uh, help offset the cost of hunting and fishing fees, but it can't supplant any dollars that are already there. Uh, one of the areas that we're using it for is to uh, immediately get cash available to, to deal with aquatic evasive species problems in Minnesota. The, Asi the Asian carp or milfoil or zebra mussels or things like that, but I don't, you know, I don't see it being taken away. I see um, uh, a very strong emphasis on both sides of the party or aisle to make sure it's handled correctly. And there was some talk about using legacy funds, arts legacy funds for the capital renovation. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that would be an appropriate use of legacy funds either. Yeah, there was some talk. In fact, as recently as a couple of weeks ago, we had one of our panelists who mentioned that maybe some of the artwork in the Capitol might be in that category. But 
Well, the artwork within the Capitol, right. perhaps, yeah. but not the reno whole right. renovation yeah. job. There's too much. You actually need a lot of HVAC yeah. work, heating, ventilating, air conditioning. Work. And to keep the pieces from the building from falling. <laughs> right, and, uh, right. Visitors. And, I and am and in keep favor. Water of, from dripping. Yeah. And, <laughs> I hope we do address the Capitol in some form, not ne not necessarily legacy dollars, but it's there are places where it's it's. Uh, sort of falling apart and we need to take care of that. And it's the people's building yeah. and it, it's a gem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Cass just, Gilbert did a fabulous job. I right. Just on that note, it has nothing to do with the questions I'm supposed to be asking you, but but uh, we get a fair number of folks who come through and uh, I, I simply would tell people if they if the last time they were here was in the sixth grade, they should come down and have the History Center folks uh, give them a tour of the building. It yeah. is a remarkable facility. Yeah. Um, and uh, even with its needs, current needs, it's yeah. still worth seeing. Viewer from Glenwood wants to talk, uh, wants to have us talk about uh, the hunting and fishing license uh, fee increases. Not sure if the viewers for them or against them, as they say, but yeah. uh, what's going on in that area? We'll, well pick on you again, yeah, since it's kind of your area. It is uh, my area. Um, well, a couple things. We have one bill that says uh, that we should never, uh, if there's ever a shutdown, that you should still be able to buy your fishing license from your Cabela's or Fleet Farm or wherever, and that one may move through. Uh, but as far as the actual fees themselves, uh, the DNR has not raised the fees for hunting and fishing in the last 10 years. And it's those funds are directly towards hunting and fishing and, and uh, projects related to that. And so I, I don't know for sure, but I think we'll see a modest increase. I think there's you know, the, all the sportsman groups all are asking for that. <laughs> Uh, tied into that, we're also going to have a, a wolf hunting and trapping season. So, a lot of things coming down the pipe. But I, if I was to be to educate a guest, would say that we will have that, but I don't know for sure yet. Senator Pappas, any thoughts on that? Um, my only thoughts are on the shutdown bills, mm -hmm. and that um, I don't think they're a good idea because um, we need deadlines. <laughs> Yeah. And if we just have these kind of continuing resolutions, we'll never resolve anything. And I, I think we have to resolve these issues. So, yeah, part of the reason I bring that up because I, I think, um, you know, in this last shutdown, we had about seventy, or at least seventy percent of the state was just down. And so we are taking a look at every area that why did we shut this area down, whether it's zoos or mm -hmm. state parks or hunting and fishing. And, and there's been a conversation on both sides that, you know, we should feel the pressure of a shutdown so that we'll move forward. But in the end, I think that uh, the governor and the legislative bodies, I don't care who's in charge, we don't have to drag the people of Minnesota through it. But this hunting and fishing one in particular, that's a bill that I carried uh, in Crow Wing County. Uh, we, well, statewide, we lost 20,000 out-of-state licenses, 20,000 less the DNR estimated were not purchased. And that was people moving into all the resorts in my area and, and around the state and, and buying food and eating, you know, all the things that they would spend money on. The DNR alone lost two to three million dollars, but the tourism industry was incredibly impacted. And you just couldn't go into your gas station and buy an electronic uh, fishing license, which still was available to do. And so those kind of things, I hope we, you know, So you think people allowed. still went fishing? They just didn't buy a license? Well, some did. I'll tell you, in Crow Wing County, the, uh, the commissioners passed a resolution, DNR, please let these people fish and they can come back after. So our local DNR folks, common sense rural folks, mm -hmm. they said, that's a good idea. But then the, the state DNR said, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So I think some did, but it just it was just a frustration for many, many people. Well, we um, we got nearly halfway through before the question showed up that we get every week, which of course is Viking Stadium. <laughs> how did you know that? Uh, <laughs> this viewer wants to know how is anyone has anyone thought of a specific lottery ticket just to pay for the Viking Stadium? This caller thinks Minnesotans would buy them. We'll take that question and run with it, but we'll also take the broader question of what's going on on that topic. Senator Pappas, if you want to go. Well, it really? seems to be stalled, and um, I'm not privy as to the reasons it's stalled, but, you know, it's always kind of finding the proper funding source. The viewer suggests a lottery ticket, but, of course, there's actually no, not usually any extra money around. You're just taking money from Peter to pay Paul. So people who would have normally bought a lottery ticket and it would have fund the environment and the other things that the lottery funds will now, that money will just be shifted to a Viking stadium. Plus, if you're going to build something that that's expensive, you have to have a funding source that's, that's reliable. And gambling is not really considered a reliable source. So whether it's pull tabs or Racino or 
um, lottery tickets, there still has to be another uh, backup funding for that. And that typically would be, you know, state bonds of some kind. And so you're still putting the taxpayers' dollars at risk. Senator Gazalka? It's, uh, it's almost like a, a no-win situation. If you lose the Vikings, there's a tremendous uh, consequence. And if you keep the Vikings and spend a lot of money, it's difficult. But uh, the challenge is, um, you know, the Vikings are requesting in state help about $650 million. And that's, that's a lot of dollars that we would contribute, either the Minneapolis or the state or gambling or whatever. And so that's, that's really where the challenge is. Um, you know, I'm concerned as well on, on some of the gaming uh, portions of the formula because if you if you increase electronic gaming that's where the most addictive form of, of uh, gambling is and so you know what kind of problems that does that produce that we're not even measuring uh, I know Roger Chamberlain Senator Chamberlain had a bill that uh, would generate about 300 million and uh, really treated the Vikings like another business where we would give them tax credits low interest loans etc so it's it's a but the Vikings aren't interested no they're not interested in that and it's a constantly <laughs> shifting um, issue. I, you know, frankly, I saw some news from 10 years ago that said this year we'll have, you know, progress on a stadium. So, you know, it's, so it's, a, it's, a, it's extremely difficult. And uh, it's not in the, my committee right now, but I heard it stalled in, in I think, local government. And, uh, well, and I know. think when the Minneapolis City Council signed off, that was, they were supposed to be the barrier. Yeah. And nothing's happened since they signed yeah. off. Yeah, and so. it's not a Republican-Democrat issue. It's you have no. both sides, either for or against, and we're you know, we'll just have to wait and see. I would just recommend that we build a new St. Paul stadium, <laughs> in, uh, not a stadium, a ballpark in downtown St. Paul, for, and the Saints will play there, and amateur baseball players will play there, and it hardly costs the state anything, $27 million as opposed to six. million. And we, we actually have had some questions from viewers about that particular project. I gather that's not in the Senate bill. Am I right about that? I don't that? think it, it is. It is no. not, right. and that's the number one priority in St. Paul and by the St. Paul Chamber, so it's business and the labor community yeah. um, and all the legislators. Well, stay tuned, as they say, yeah. right? Um, yeah, in fact, we have a question from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, who's, who also thinks that we should do something about our stadium bills. If you identifies himself as a diehard Vikings fan, so you can, you can tell the Sioux Falls folks that we're going to get those jobs back, too. So. <laughs> all right. Um, we, uh, we had a question here about K-12 education, whether there was anything happening on that. And, and I, I think, generally speaking, that issue is an um, odd-numbered session year. But let's talk about that generally. Senator Pappas, is there anything Well, I think there? the most controversial issue is this um, uh, uh, last hired, first fired issue around mm -hmm. teachers and seniority is uh, whether teachers should be evaluated and um, rewarded for good performance or let go of their bad teachers. And kind of the debate is that there was um, last year an evaluation system that's been developed and it's still in the process. So to go ahead and, and move with a um, change in the seniority system is premature. Um, but it does, and what is I the think, status of that bill right now? Um, Before the governor. Or it's passed, I think it passed. The House and it passed, yeah. right. right. I think it was in conference committee. Yeah. It just came out of conference committee, so it'll come back for final passage. And, you know, again, it has mixed support, uh, Democrat and Republican, some Democratic support. Um, but uh, we all really support education reform. You know, as a, as a kind of a higher ed person, I want more rigorous courses. I want students to be better prepared for college. I think that's really important. I'm concerned about the achievement gap. And I think that if we put more of a focus on early childhood education, preschool kids, because that's when kindergarten teachers, they can see already if there's a gap. These kids are not ready for kindergarten, you know, vocabulary issues. Some kids know 300 words, some know 50 words. Mm -hmm. They see already that there's a gap. And if we just did intensive work in preschool before the kids get behind, I think that would be a very, and, and the statistics, the studies have shown that it's like a 1 to 16 benefit. If you invest dollars in preschool, you benefit $16 for every dollar you invest. Yeah, it's been, uh, and I, I'd rather look at it as a two-year period last year and this year because we've done quite a bit. Um, you know, Senator Pappas talked about reaching them when they're young, and, and one of the things that came through was a literacy bonus that I believe takes place in 2013. 
if the schools are, are doing well in uh, reaching them by, I think, third grade or fourth grade, third grade, I think it is. So that was uh, uh, something we did. We, we passed uh, alternative pathways for teacher licensing. You know, if we can find a teacher that happens to be really good in the field and they want to pick them, they can. Uh, LIFO was this year, and I, you know, I, I hope it passes. I, I don't want uh, seniority to be the the only determining Last factor. Last in, first out. Like, yeah. yeah, right. Did I say it right? Yeah, I LIFO. I, did. I thought it at FIFO. If it's LIFO, but right. but that's a that's a big deal. Uh, it, it's not just saying we're going to only keep young teachers, but it gives the local school districts some ability to choose when they need to. And so those are some big things. Uh, the other big thing that was a, a frustration for local schools that I think. We're, we're doing this year. Uh, last year, again, there was an education shift of a little over 700 million on top of the whatever it was, 1.4 million or, or more. Uh, we paid back almost half of that already this year, and we passed legislation uh, that used some of the budget reserves to pay back the rest. That will be moving before the governor as well. Uh, so there's been a lot of things we're trying to do, both reform wise and funding. And I'll say in addition to trying to repay it back the shift, we also did give them $50 per pupil increase in funding. So overall for K-12, um, I think it's been a, an interesting two years with reforms and, and uh, funding. Not all is, is, um, is well, though, in the education area. In the higher ed area, in the last 12 years, we've actually reduced funding for our higher ed systems by 40 percent. And tuition has gone up almost that much. So, and that's really a result of a drop in state funding. So as we've preserved K-12, we haven't expanded in early childhood, and we've really cut back in higher ed. Mm -hmm. And that means our students have higher debt loads. They can't graduate on time because they have to work because the tuition is so high. And it's just not a real sustainable system. And I, I hope we work at different models. I think both sides are interested in this. From 10th grade forward, you know, we've been sending kids to four years of college, and then they come back and they do VOTEC, and maybe they should have started in 11th or 12th grade on a path that's different. And, you know, so a lot of people are rethinking, are we doing the best by our, our kids as they're getting into those stages where they're going to have careers? And I think we'll see a different model five or ten years from now. And I'm a real big uh, booster of dual enrollment, where students yeah. can take college courses while they're in high school and get dual credit. Me too. Um, and instead of, you know, or if, if they're not mature enough to go to college, at least to be able to take college courses in high school, whether it's college yeah. in the schools or go to your local VOTEC. We don't have vocational programs in high schools anymore. So a real nice possibility for them, if they can, if they have that available, is to go to their local technical college and take yeah. courses. I agree. Mm -hmm. You're from Rochester wants to talk about the, um, uh, I think I'm going to call it the high-speed train from Rochester to the Twin Cities that has been sort of on again, off again discussion. <coughs> Viewers concerned about uh, what's happening on that, where the money might come from, et cetera, uh, whether or not uh, that's on the radar screen at all. Who wants to take a run at that, if anybody? It's not, it's not on my radar as a rural uh, legislator. I focus more on roads and bridges. It just, you know, it's what... Uh, my view is uh, I know that uh, light rail is, is um, discussed back and forth. I'm on transportation, and we, uh, you know, I, I look more towards buses because you have the opportunity to move them if the population moves. But I'm, as far as right, light rail from Rochester, it's not on my radar. And this would be, I think, high-speed rail to right. Rochester, so oh, it's heavy yeah. rail. It's yeah. a little different. And yeah. I think it's really important that we have a kind of a multimodal transit system. The Union Depot, we've got some federal money and some state money to prepare the Union Depot in St. Paul to be kind of the hub of that system, where you have light rail going to Minneapolis, light rail then going out to Eden Prairie with the Southwest Corridor, which was not funded in the Bonnie Bill either. Mm -hmm. And... Um, light rail going uh, um, north as well on the, uh, along the east here. Um, and then the rail can fill for, from places like from um, the cities, the Twin Cities, to Rochester. And it, can be a, it could be a very nice alternative to, you don't really fly so much from Rochester, but mm -hmm. to have that access to the Mayo Clinic, I'm sure that would be very helpful. And there's quite a bit of federal dollars available for, um, for um, heavy rail. Uh, we were planning on doing um, high-speed rail from the Twin Cities to Chicago, but Wisconsin governor decided to opt out of the whole system. So now I think they're looking at just avoiding Wisconsin and going through Iowa, which means then they could come up through Rochester instead of from Wisconsin. 
All right, we have a question from a viewer, not a tail. It's actually a two-part question. One is concerned about uh, property taxes being too high, and this viewer wants to know if there's going to be anything done about that. The viewer raises a second question, which I think is a little more complicated, but I think it's related to that first question, and this viewer is wondering about how we might uh, reorganize our revenue sources uh, for uh, government and whether or not we need to be talking about that. Um, and, uh, you know, that could be anything from tax increases on existing sources to changing our entire tax structure. So there's really two questions there. Both of them uh, could be pretty complicated, but who wants mm -hmm. to take a run at it? Uh, Senator Pappas, please start I'm with happy you. to start. Um, the whole issue with property taxes for a lot of communities um, and why they've been going up is complicated, but there's multiple reasons. One is the state provides local government aid to cities that have and counties that have low property tax wealth. And, and in other words, they don't have a lot of um, uh, business property that produces more taxes. And it's, it's a bedroom community or it's both <laughs> residential, and so the residential community has to bear that. And so the state decided to have a partnership with local communities and that they would provide local government aid. And during the last 10 years, local government aid has been cut. So rural towns, um, urban cities have been, have had to raise their property taxes to make up for that cut. And then just our whole housing slump is a problem where our, all of our property is devalued. And so it's kind of disconcerting, and I share the, the, um, the viewer's pain with my own taxes, is your, your value of your property is going down, yet your taxes are going up. Mm -hmm. um, for that very reason is that, you know, there's not enough revenue now being spread over a broad enough base. Um, so that's a problem. It's definitely a problem. And, and in terms of other revenue sources, if we wanted to go into that, the only way we could really help with property taxes is if we did have more sources of funding from other places. For example, a proposal that the Chamber has supported is extending the sales tax to clothing. Uh, we're one of the few states in the country that doesn't tax clothing. Um, it, it can be progressive in that wealthier people buy more expensive clothing. Um, poor low-income people can buy at thrift stores. You can exempt thrift stores. You can exempt children's clothing. Mm -hmm. You can have a, a rebate on your taxes. There's various ways you can make that a more progressive tax. And I do support pro progressive taxes in general, and I think that um, since we dropped that four tier, fourth tier, we have been, in, since 1999, we have had problems with bringing in enough revenue to really meet our expenses. Yeah, property taxes are very complicated. I had the, the commissioners from Morrison County in my office today with the uh, county administrator, and we took a look at their overall uh, levied amount, and it was the same in 2011 or, and 2012, <laughs> meaning they're doing an incredible job as far as trying to hold the line, and yet their their tax increase or percentage increases were up, I think, 6 7%. So we talked about that, and Senator Pappas is right. If, if your values are going down and they need the same amount of money, then it's going to show a, a higher increase, even though your values are going down. And so there's, you know, and if your value is going down, uh, less than others, you're going to pay more because your percentage is now different. So it, yeah. it's a fairly complicated um, situation, but uh, it, it is what it is. And the other thing about local government aid, you know, in my area, for example, Brainerd gets local government aid, but Baxter, which is directly next to Brainerd, gets no local government aid. And so one of the things we did in, is tried to freeze those dollar amounts from 2010 to 2013 all the same same each year if by inflation their dollars are going up they may, they would say they don't get as much but really it was the same amount every year and I, I agree with Senator Pappas related to sales tax if you look at South Dakota theirs is a much broader group that they collect taxes on but they only collect about four percent compared or we would only have to charge four percent versus what we do now about seven if we spread it out farther um, we had a question earlier about bonding capacity, and the highly efficient, famous <laughs> Pioneer Public Television staff uh, has handed me this note from the Minnesota Impressive. Management and Budget Debt Capacity Forecast from February 2012. Thank God. This is riveting television, yeah. folks. I want you to hang on every word. Take here. notes here. Yeah, take notes. As of February 29, 2012, the state of Minnesota had five million or five billion four hundred twenty-eight million principal amount of GO bonds, general obligation mm -hmm. bonds, outstanding, uh, as well as. 528 million of other tax supported obligations for a total 
of essentially $6 billion outstanding as of the date of the forecast. Now, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent, <laughs> right. or meets whatever guidelines, I'm not, sure. not going to get into that discussion. Uh -oh. But I am going to tell you that if you go to our Facebook page, we have a link to uh, this document, and you can go, uh, you can go get lost in these numbers uh, to your heart's content. So, but I just want to let you know that we, 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 we can get the question answered here. I learned something new tonight. Um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, not about issues that either are, are on the ballot already. Uh, we've got one on the ballot already. We've got another one that we discussed earlier that might be on the ballot. There has been discussion of other issues that might be on the ballot. Um, are we really looking at two constitutional issues in November, or are there others that, that, are, that might pop up? Do we have a handle on that at this point in the session? We'll start with you, Senator Gisella. Yeah, you know, there's, there's uh, certainly other ones that have been talked about. Uh, employee freedom, or what some people call right to work, uh, uh, certainly had a serious run at it. I, I don't see that one moving forward. I'm, you know, I'm one of many, but I, I don't see that moving forward, at least this year. Um, it wasn't like other states that didn't get rid of collective bargaining. It simply gave the employee the right to choose whether they wanted to join or not join a union and pay or not pay union dues. But I, I, I think that one's, I think it's done. Uh, there was some conversation about a Minnesota Second Amendment right, a right to bear arms. Uh, I don't know that that's, I think we're, we're late enough in the game that I, I, I don't see anything making it through. And finally, there was another one that I think had fairly serious attention, and that was something related to financial accountability. You can't have a tax increase without some sort of majority, or, or there's a few, a few like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> those are also, those also are not like yeah, I don't see any of those moving forward at, at this late mm -hmm. uh, stage of the game. I could be wrong, but I, that's my best guess. Senator? I agree. Um, I think that the majority party is decided they either don't have the votes or don't want the hassle. We don't want to be another Wisconsin where you kind of upset every union member in the state and have them, you know, occupy that Capitol building for months. You know, that doesn't, wasn't helpful, didn't make anyone look good. It just seemed like your, your state was in chaos. And, you know, a lot of these things also can be handled statutorily. That's the, you know, I think that with the right, with the voter ID, for example, that you know, the governor had objections to whatever was in the bill. Those could be worked out. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think there is even a proposal from Secretary Ritchie for an alternative yeah. pr approach instead of putting something on the ballot. I, I just think we are taking it too lightly, these issues that we think are ballot initiatives that we should kind of struggle to, to work them out with the executive branch rather than running to the Constitution for everything. You know, and let me, if right. I can comment sure. on that, too, because I, if you look through the history of Minnesota, we've had over 200 uh, constitutional amendments proposed and, and over half of those uh, adopted. So it clearly from the beginning it was a tool that could be used, uh, I think thoughtfully, carefully, but uh, certainly has been used at a, a pace similar to what we're doing right now. Um, you know, so in the photo ID, photo ID one, is it's just an interesting one. The governor vetoed it, so we, we're moving forward with it this way. Uh, but I think there's also a case, I believe, in Wisconsin where they're challenging their their law because it's not in the Constitution. So I, by luck or skill, I, you know, us moving forward this way, if we want this, I think is appropriate. You're from Buffalo wants to talk about the omnibus pension bill. And is there anything happening in that capacity? Uh, does anyone know anything about this issue? I do. I'm on the Pension Commission. I've been on the Pension Commission for six or seven years now. Um, we did most of our reform uh, a couple years ago in terms of making sure all our pension systems were on the track to be um, fully funded. So we made everyone had to pay more, basically, and everyone had to get less and because of the volatility of the market and the fact that the market wasn't producing the kind of interest rate. So still in taking a look at the market, we are lowering the interest rate assumption from 8.5% to 8% and then we're going to look at it over the next couple of years to see if that's the appropriate amount. So um, the Pension Commission is bipartisan. We work in a very bipartisan way, and we work to kind of safeguard the, the pensions of, uh, of our state employees, our government and, employees. And in fact, I think I should just mention to our viewers, Senator Pappas, maybe you could just, um, because of your experience here at the Capitol, maybe fill in on the details, but this this bipartisan approach to the pension issues is actually something of, not of recent vintage. It actually goes back some, some period of time. Am I right about that? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And if I can make one brief comment on that, we looked at the bill in, in state government 
and uh, Senator Daley um, had an amendment that we adopted. I don't know if it'll stay or not stay. It got taken off in finance. Oh, it did already. This <laughs> because you know, uh, some of my background in, in finances and investments, uh, I see pensions in the, the private sector, and, and eight and a half percent, or even eight, is on the high side of what you expect. And part of it because we want um, uh, we want to be conservative on those returns in the private sector. Uh, the people lose out if, if they don't plan it right. In the public sector, well, then the, the taxpayer ends up having to kick in. And I think the work you guys did in mm -hmm. 2010 was great. We you know, and I, and I, We're going to keep know. a close eye on yeah, it. And, good. you know, the State Board of Investment is very good, very sharp, and they have historically over the last 40 years, um, they have averaged around 8.5%. But, you know, this could be a new normal. Yeah. And we have to be careful. And but if we lower it too quickly, then it really does drop the funding ratio very dramatically, yep. and could scare a lot of people. So yep. we'll we'll take it down to eight percent. Keep an eye on it. Even I think um, Daly's bill went eight and a quarter, then eight yeah, percent. Correct. So they were very similar. You know, it wasn't it wasn't the end of the world to do his mm -hmm. proposal. It just had been rejected by the Pension Commission, and we have kind of a strong tradition of keeping the Pension Commission whole. Otherwise, you can get a lot of crazy amendments on the floor. <laughs> well, in fact, this, is, this has been an issue. I mean, and I'm not, I'm not making a policy statement here defending uh, or attacking what has been done elsewhere, but the fact of the matter is in other states that haven't had that, that bipartisan tradition, you have had the tendency for this to be a little bit of a political football, and, yeah. and it, creates, it creates its own set of issues. I'm amazed we both knew something about that one. <laughs> <laughs> a viewer from, uh, we had a viewer's question about the uh, Health and Human Services bill uh, and what, if anything, uh -oh. is likely to happen in this session. <laughs> I, and, I, and I should tell our viewer that um, our two representatives, uh, Jim Davney and Paul Anderson, who could not be with us tonight, are, um, are, in fact, at this moment um, dealing with uh, the bill on the House side. So, so the viewer should just turn on you, yeah. whatever, yeah, whatever channel it is, or whatever, it is, or whatever, it is or whatever and, yeah. and watch to find out No, 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 they got to wait until we're done. Then oh, they can oh, turn then it they on. Can so, turn it on. Okay. All right, Senator okay. Pappas, what's going on in health? Oh, businesses? you know what? I have to, I have to plead ignorance here. Mm -hmm. I really don't know. I don't know the issues. I don't serve on the committee. I, um, I think there's some controversy over whether we're going to implement the Affordable Care Act, which is now in the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. and there may not be one by June, so depending on what the court does. So um, I really don't know. I think I, I think I know a little bit about um, uh, maybe tightening up the mm -hmm. welfare system, and is that appropriate to do or not? Or are you know is our system just fine? However, it is comply with federal law, whatever. Do you know it more than I know about um, Paul? <laughs> they have a nurses compact where uh, nurses could come from another place to work here. Uh, it made the process easier. In the end, they loaded up so many bills on it. <laughs> I don't know if it's yeah, going to Yeah, I mean, there was one anywhere. thing about the limit on being able to collect um, public assistance is five years. Yeah. I think they might have lowered it to three years. Yeah. Um, I personally, being a higher ed person, would like to see um, people on welfare go to school. Yeah. so that they can eventually get a living wage and support their family. Yeah. And I think we kind of lost that focus on education and pushed it on work, even yeah. if it's minimum wage work. And it'd be better okay. if they went to school. And health and Human Services, you know, last year our projection for its growth was 22% in a two-year biennium. And we, we slowed that growth down to 5%, but it's, it's, there's so many areas of that that it's just fairly complicated. Well, and the growth area, though, is mostly in nursing homes yeah, because a, we have an aging yeah. population. And yeah. believe me, my mother's in one, and $6,000 a month, she's a private pay patient, mm -hmm. is a lot of money to be yeah. paying. And it can just really, families just go broke yeah. paying it, or the state will go broke right. paying it. And in fact, that's another one that they that is moving through the process is mm -hmm. nursing homes in Minnesota can only charge uh, the Medicaid reimbursement rate even for private pay. Uh, it's only one of two states in the country that does that, and I think this went into that bigger bill too. But uh, if if it's frozen in a given year, then that nursing home, if this passes, would have the right to raise the private pay 2%, so that's, that's a little bit of a change. I think the biggest thing to keep, a tra keep an eye on, uh, Senator Pappas mentioned it, but it's the health care exchanges. Uh, we don't know how that's all going to play out uh, under the Affordable Health Care Act or Obamacare mm -hmm. that's mandated, but if the courts overturn it in June, then we don't know. So, mm -hmm. but, but something has to be done if it continues moving forward. So 
we need to keep our eye on that. Senator Gazelka, I'm going to ask you a question we actually got a couple of weeks ago, because um, I know this is an issue of concern for your constituents, and this has to do with school start times. There yeah. was some talk about legislation, or maybe the legislation's already been changed, but we had a viewer who was concerned about that. Can you tell me? Well, I, you know, uh, tourism is really, really big in my area, and I, I'm I'm a proponent of not starting until after Labor Day. Uh, I would rather have them, if they want more days, to build them in between Labor Day and Memorial Day. But that is a, every year that is a, a tug of war issue. In the metro areas, it's uh, the state fair, as, as people argue That's for what that we, one. For yeah, that and I, you know, so I, I think having uh, a lot of days of school is important, but, you know, there's longer breaks that we could fill in there. But I'm, and, and I love, frankly, my wife and I have five kids, and summer is, uh, you know, we really focus on that's when we build family time, but I realize other people have different schedules, and yeah, I think we're going to deal with it every year, but I'm going to keep holding out for after Labor Day. What is the current status of that? Can it is, doesn't start till after Labor Day. Okay, and then is there a bill pending? And is it I know there was a pilot program that was started yeah. somewhere. Usually yeah. there's some exceptions, yeah. especially if Labor Day is late yeah. one year, and mm -hmm. some school districts will have, be able to have the option of starting early, but it's... Yeah. Nothing permanent. Are you on the same wait till Labor Day? Or? Wait till Labor Day. Yeah. <laughs> See, there we go. We got something to be. There we go. We're, we're making about. progress here. <laughs> All right. Um, we only have about a minute and a half left. Just oh, you're very, kidding. No, that went we're so just, fast. We're, we're just rolling right along here. And I do want to just touch on uh, there has been some discussion in, in the press and elsewhere that uh, maybe the session is going to end in the next week or two. Uh, does anybody have a view on when we're likely to get out of here? Let's start with you, Senator Gazalka. Well, uh, we are going to make every effort to be done by the end of April. Um, we just feel like uh, um, we can. We've been running very long days you know, to try to get our work done. There is a break um, April 6th through the 16th. So, But even then, if, if we try to do that, there may be some conference committees that may meet during that time. But uh, we just feel like uh, it would save the state money. We've, we've done our work, and let's finish. Let's set an example of doing something a little different. I realize it hasn't been done in a long, long time, but uh, I think we do things different, and this would be another way of saying that. So you, you don't sound like you're in the camp, as the paper suggested, that you're going to get out of here before Easter. I, I just don't know how that can happen because there's too many major bills that are in conference okay. committee that we want to make sure get done. You know, so I, Senator, I think more. Senator Pappas, okay, my wish is April 6th. My prediction is the third Monday in May by the Constitution. <laughs> and, and I think you were telling me that somebody looked this up and uh, getting out early has happened when? Twice in the last 30 years, 96 yeah. and 98, we finished before the constitutional deadline. We're going to do it. All right. Well, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll hold you to that. We'll, yeah, we'll, uh, hopefully we'll have you back and tell you whether or not you were right or not. I'll say I told you so, I hope. <laughs> I want to thank our, our, uh, our somewhat uh, shortened panel tonight uh, for carrying the ball for us. Uh, in the absence of our House members, uh, you were terrific. I want to thank our viewers for joining us this week as you join us each week. And I want to invite you to be with us in the weeks ahead until whenever the legislature goes home, because we'll be right here with you. Thank you, and good night. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org. Find out more about the history of the program, who's been a guest, and watch all our past episodes. There's also a photo gallery, informative links, and much more. You can also get involved and stay in touch by following us on Twitter and join the discussion on our Facebook page. Thank you for watching Your Legislators. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of Meet members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. Mm -hmm.